A scintillating touchdown run. Sam Kahn was there, theathletic.com. We will get into his column today about Gary Patterson, but Sam, you saw Baylor firsthand up front. Your thoughts about what you saw with Dave Aranda's team? Really impressed by the growth and maturity this team showed uh, in circumstances in the second half, down by double digits. I, I never really, at any point in that game, even when they were down, thought this team was going to lose, in part because Texas has struggled in the second half, but also because just the flow of the game offensively, the way I thought they called it. Jeff Grimes, I thought, did a great job on the call. Uh, even with the turnovers of Bohannon, I think this team is mature. It's confident. You see how much experience there is all over the field. The team is littered with guys that were on that 2019 team, and they play that way. They play poised. They play confident. There was no panic. And when they start getting a roll in the second half and they started got those three state touchdown drives, I wasn't shocked in the least. They've done that a lot this year where they've kind of gotten on a roll and gotten in a rhythm. And when they do, boy, they're hard to stop. I think this is definitely one of the best teams in the Big 12. Sam, what do you think is the reason for Texas's second half problems? I think it's a multiple, multifaceted thing. I think psyche is part of it. Steve Sarkeesian has alluded to that. And I think it, at this point, I think it is mental. But I also think it's simply personnel. I, I just don't think Texas is there talent-wise, regardless of the recruiting rankings, which have been good or and were good in the Tom Herman era. I don't look at that team, and I've seen a lot of teams around the state and, and a few others around the country. I don't look at Texas and see elite talent up and down the roster. I see a few elite players. I think B. John Robinson's an elite player. I think David Boyd is an elite, play, elite player. I think Marvin Overshone's really good. Josh Thompson, the corner's really good. I, I don't see across the line of scrimmage a bunch of difference makers on offense or defense. I thought Baylor's offensive and defensive lines were better and have been better than Texas. To me, it starts and ends right there. And if you're not good up front on offense, if you're not good up front on defense, it's hard to win a lot of ball games and it's hard to outlast teams. You can only win with smoke and mirrors for so long. Sam, I know that Texas was able to hit some big plays and could have hit more, quite frankly, uh, if, if things would have worked out better for them. But what, what did you think uh, with Bijan Robinson heading into the weekend? He was less than 100 yards away from 1,000. And I wrote in an article, well, like, he's almost assuredly going to get you know close to 100 yards this week, and that's what he does every week. He ends up with just 43. What did you make of that? I was really surprised because if, if there's one thing that this offense has been able to count on, it's been him. But – Credit to Ron Roberts and, and the Baylor defense for what they did schematically against him. And also, I think you, you give a lot of, of, of credit to Apu because I, I watched them a lot and they were double teaming and triple teaming a lot. And guess what? Hard to run up the middle with the 350 pound guys getting double and triple teamed in the middle. So it, it makes it hard to find holes. And that, that's where a, a presence like that in the middle becomes such a value for defense because it requires so many offensive guys. So you cannot attack in uh, the middle of the line of scrimmage in between the tackles. You've got to go on that perimeter, and that's that's why they threw the ball a lot. And give give Baylor credit for their game plan. And also, I think so Sarkeesian at times, especially in these last few weeks, and set, certainly in the second half, has gotten away from Bijan. I don't know how that's happened from a play calling standpoint, but definitely against Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, and a little bit against Baylor in the stretch. It seems like as the game wears on. They kind of get away from Bijan, and, and the, the last week I think it was understandable, but the previous two weeks he was pretty successful in the first second quarter. So I'm not sure why that is, but it, it's it's a multitude of things that led to that, in my opinion. Sam, you've covered Baylor before, and you've heard Dave Aranda before, but you were there for the post game after the win against Texas. Uh, your thoughts about any references to the Berenstain uh, Bears, uh, to yellow and green lights like a traffic light on? Well, you're just what you saw from him. I, a lot of national writers when they've come in they walk away with a smile on their face with what they hear from him. I, I love Dave because he's, he's always going to give you something different that and no one else in this country will. The green light, red light thing, yellow light, I've heard before because we, we talked about that when I visited him in the spring in his office. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the Berenstain Bears, that is absolutely in my 17-year career coloring college football. <laughs> first time I've heard a Berenstain Bears reference in a press conference. And, so, and you know what? The way he broke it down, it wasn't like, I'm just going to throw this book reference out. Like, no, I'm actually going to go through this story. You can tell he sat there and read it to his children. So, I mean, that's, that's impressive. As someone who I read to, to my kid every night before bed, I can certainly appreciate somebody who knows the story and can recite it quite that well on a dime. Sam, uh, TCU, open for the first time in 21 years. Gary Patterson's out. You can kind of feel the heat getting hotter on him just to, on the different rants he went on week to week and the way that they were playing, not only offensively but defensively. How surprised were you by this, and, and who do you see as a natural fit to take over that job? 
I was surprised by the timing. Not necessarily that it was heading that way, but I certainly didn't expect uh, to get a message during a phone call last night, before, early last yesterday evening, saying that Gary Patterson's departure was about to be announced. Uh, I certainly thought it would have been an end-of-season thing if it happened this year. Uh, and I also thought Patterson would have a little bit of a say in, in the end of his tenure, but clearly that wasn't the case. There was just a multitude of issues uh, that, that were present there. And I think the biggest one you hit on it is defense. The one thing you've always been able to count on and a Gary Patterson TCU team is a great defense. And boy, they have been bad on that side of the ball this year. They haven't been able to rush the pass effectively. They've been beat up. They've had guys play out of position because of injuries. Uh, they haven't been able to stop teams. They've been one of the worst rushing defenses in the country. They've been one of the worst defenses, period. They're, they're in the bottom 20, 30 in the, na- in the nation in yards for play, in scoring defense, you name it. So it's been really unfortunate to see how they train on that side of the ball because I look at the roster and I look at the talent, and to me, they're one of the most talented teams in the conference. And when you, I think when you guys see them on Saturday, you watch their guys run around, they are a supremely talented team. But it did not translate on the field. And I think the downward trajectory of the last four years, uh, they, they haven't been a great team. They haven't competed for the Big 12 title like they had early on in their time in the conference or, or competed for conference titles like they did early on in Gary Passion's tenure before they entered the Big 12. It's, it, it's not been going in the right direction. And in this day and age when – you have an uncertain future in the Big 12. Uh, you, you know you, The conference is going to be without Texas and Oklahoma. You've got to kind of establish yourself. I think Jeremiah Donati and TCU leadership decided, hey, we've got we've got to right the ship somehow. And I know for some people it's tough to push out a legend that's taken them to unprecedented heights, but uh, certainly they felt like something had to change. So, Sam, you are known as the uh, tech expert over at The Athletic, the Texas expert. You, you cover – all the Texas schools, and uh, man, you have not had any shortage of storylines. I mean, the Gary Patterson one, but you look at what's going on, just the coaching carousel, and and what could happen if, you know, just, let's say, Dykes moves to to TCU or to Texas Tech, and then what that means for other jobs. Just what do you make of the kind of wild landscape in the state right now? Yeah, I thought coming into the season, I thought maybe we might have one or two jobs open. Maybe, Maybe Texas Tech, maybe North Texas open. But I certainly didn't anticipate we'd have two before November 1st. <laughs> and then we, we probably could have more at the end of the season. I think, you know, keep an eye on North Texas. Keep an eye on Texas State. Uh, you know, the, and then if, like you said, if Sonny Dykes moves on to, to one of these two open Power 5 jobs in the state, SMU will open up. So uh, it could be a very, very eventful, silly season uh, in the state of Texas this fall. Certainly – not quite what I envisioned, but but I'm ready for it. I've spent a lot of time on the phone the last couple of weeks. I anticipate I'm going to spend a lot of time on the phone in the next month uh, month plus. But um, it's going to be interesting to see. You mentioned Dykes. I think if, if he, I think either one of those jobs, Tech or TCU, would be a good fit. Obviously, he's got the ties to Texas Tech. You know, his dad coached there. Sonny's an alum. Played baseball there. He's been an assistant there under Mike Leach in the heyday. But TCU is a really attractive job too, with its location facilities, financial resources, you name it, what they've been built to be because of Gary Patterson's success, that is a really attractive job in the Big 12. And, and Sonny's been there. He spent the time there as a, as a staff, support staffer with Gary Patterson before he took the SMU job. So that would be a natural fit if he decided to go that way. I could see him doing well in either one of those two spots. Sticking with that carousel and, and coaching talk, your thoughts on Jeff Trailer uh, and the announcement from UTSA yesterday? Really impressed by UTSA. I, I, I did not know that they had the wherewithal to pay a coach $2.8 million. Uh, it, I think a lot of people assumed that Trailer would be uh, a hot candidate for the Texas Tech job, which he was definitely one of their top targets. And with the CCU job opening, he, he would have been a candidate for that as well. But Trailer, and, and I visited with him over the course of this last month, he, he seems very happy there because he is kind of the king of his own kingdom there in San Antonio. He doesn't get much interference from his athletic director or president. They trust him. He kind of runs the, the things the way they want it. He's got a new conference that they're going into, which, which is going to be a little bit of a step up for UTSA. That's a little bit of an appeal. And I, I think just being there two years, it feels like that he's got some unfinished business. I think, I, I don't know that he'll be there forever, but I think he may be waiting for an even bigger job. Uh, than the ones that are open right now. Uh, and in the meantime, I think he's happy. If, if you're able to pay him what they're paying him, which is not too far off what, what Texas Tech was playing Matt Wells. They were playing Matt Wells $3.1 million. So if you're able to have a competitive salary, you're happy, you run the program the way you want it, they're building facilities, they're committed to improving the program, and, and you've got kids that 
buy into you and believe in you, hey, uh, there's nothing wrong with, with being happy and staying where you are. So looks like I think he'll be there for at least another year or two, and then I guess we'll see if, if they continue to succeed at the level that they are right now. Uh, schools are not going to stop calling and sniffing around on Jeff Trailer. Jeff Trailer today at 4.30 here. Dave Aranda coming up next. Sam's tweet last night. This was late last night after a long day. Uh, Heather Dennett's put up uh, what might end up being the college football standings. And Sam goes, if a 13-0 Cincinnati with a road win at Notre Dame gets left out of the playoff in favor of a bunch of one-loss power five teams, I will riot. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, a lot of TCU and Baylor fans are already warning Cincy yeah. fans about how this yeah. goes. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean they they know how it goes. Uh, I mean, here's the thing: if 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 we want to say that these Group of Five programs and, and college athletic leadership wants to say that the FBS, the Football Bowl Subdivision, is all one division and everybody has a chance, then to me, a 13 and 0 Cincinnati, who by the way will have a win over a good SMU team. And they're probably a pretty good Houston team in the conference championship game if Cincinnati indeed goes 13 and 0. That combined with a win over what right now is a top 12 Notre Dame team, I I don't see why that why that resume is not good enough in my opinion. And I look at a team like Oklahoma, and no offense to Oklahoma, but they don't have a win as good as Notre Dame on their slate right now. Their their combined FBS opponents record is worse, and winning percentage is worse than that of Cincinnati's at this moment. Now they'll have a chance. Oklahoma will have a chance to get some better wins because they've got Baylor and Oklahoma State on the back end. But I, I just don't like the different way we evaluate these teams based on what conference they're in or what their logo is or what their name is. Uh, just tell me what has happened on the field. What has that team looked like on the field? And yes, Cincinnati the last two weeks hasn't looked great, but for, before that, the, their first five six games, they have been, in my opinion, one of the best teams in the country. And so if they continue to do that, and and you're going to give other teams a pass. For, for losing a game while you dock uh, Cincinnati for struggling against Tulane, which, by the way, Oklahoma did too. To me, it's just an uneven evaluation and an unfair playing field. And to me, if, if we're going to do that, then let's just separate the division completely. Allow the group of five to have its own playoff. Allow the power five to have its own playoff. Let's do it that way, and let's stop pretending that we're really having an equitable system where everybody has a real shot. This is why I think a 12-team playoff expansion is sorely needed in the college football landscape. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Sam Kong, good to see you. Get some rest, man. I saw that bottle of Samuel Adams in front of your <laughs> laptop. That was 17 hours ago, so let me see. That was at midnight. Is that right? About yeah. <laughs> yeah, I needed it, uh, and I will tell you I'm going to bed early. <laughs> <laughs> You've earned it, buddy. Good to see you Saturday. Good job on the column. Thanks for being a part of the show. That's uh, Sam Kong. JuniorTheAthletic.com. Just saw that uh, Jeremiah Donati is going to speak to the media tomorrow. I didn't see a time for it, but that will be his first public comments and I guess time in front of the media since uh, the news yesterday, obviously, with Patterson's exit. So uh, we will get some TCU uh, AD talk tomorrow at some point. All right. The, the chat room, we have not been able to read much of it, but we're watching uh, and, and love it. Appreciate you. A lot of you on many things from uh, Gary Patterson to to uh, UCF uh, people wanting to say, hey, we're a part of the Big 12 now. We love how this conference hey, is together. Look at the Big 12. Look at the new Big 12 in the rankings right now. Look at the new Big 12 over yeah. the weekend. What's going on here? Yeah. I like it. I know. Since he's representing BYU got a big win. I watched that game till what felt like 4 o'clock in the morning, even though it was it was not that late. But, you know, uh, Tyler Algiers, another big performance. Jaron Hall looked good. BYU had to rally a bit, and that was a – a nice win. So, yeah, I mean, UCF gets a big win. And, yeah, let's go Big 12. New Big Houston, 12. Houston. Yeah, and, and obviously, gosh, gosh almighty, uh, Houston with a massive, massive win. That <laughs> unbelievable ending. I mean, the kick return touchdown, uh, just an improbable Did, did you know play. that guy has nine yeah. returns? Yeah, nine. They touchdowns. said it during the play-by-play. -play. Yeah. They were like, hey, he's got nine touchdowns. Like, make it ten or yeah. whatever they said. I would have kicked it straight out of bounds, even if it went out of bounds at the 38-yard line. I'm kicking it straight yeah, out of bounds yeah. in that situation. But you look at all four of the new teams, and they're either in the top 25 or yep. flirting with it. And uh, So, yeah, that's great. That's Good awesome. Good to see an SMU a tough loss for them, and yeah. now they have to themselves deal with the possibility of what happens with their coach. Uh, all right, when we come back, my conversation with Baylor head football coach Dave Aranda on many things, sometimes much more than just football, which I enjoy when I get a chance to visit with him. And that's next on Sikkim 365 Radio.